Good evening. Thank you for joining us. We're going to go ahead and get started. We're going to call the Castle Hills uh, Special City Council meeting to order and determine if a quorum is present. A quorum is present. Uh, we'll go ahead and go to the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Rapley, will you lead us? Thank you, Mr. Rapley. Okay. First item is a presentation discussion by representatives from Texas Department of Transportation on the proposed I-410 at US 281 San Pedro Avenue operational improvements. Mr. Rapley. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, yes, we have uh, representatives from TxDOT uh, beginning with Clayton Ripps and staff and then um, we also have a gentleman from AGT, I believe, uh, as the consultant of the project here. Uh, I think the idea is that we will go through the presentation that they have provided to you all. Uh, and then after that, uh, we can open up for any questions um, and or input from the citizens um, or questions that uh, council members may have. And then uh, the second item is there's any action that the council wants to take as a as a result of uh, the Q&A and the presentation itself. I think, let's see who's on the line. Is it Clayton? Yeah, hey Ryan. Hey Clayton. So um, I, Clayton, I don't know if you wanna open it up and um, um, uh, as far as the process here and then um, introduce to your consultant for the project itself. Sure. Yeah, my name is Clayton Ripps. I work with TxDOT here in the San Antonio district. I'm the transportate. I'm basically the director of transportation planning and development. So every project that starts from just a drawing on a napkin to an idea to an identified need to identifying the funding for it, going through the environmental process to developing the schematics. Uh, the purview that I kind of covered goes through developing it all the way up to getting it, the plans ready to uh, go out to bid. So up until the dirt, the day you turn dirt is kind of the, the purview of what, what I oversee. So just kind of give you an idea. Um, so if there's specific construction questions, you know, that'd be something outside of what you know, we would be here to talk about today. Um, with me on the call are folks from TxDOT, uh, Richard De La Cruz, who's the uh, new director of transportation planning um, here in San Antonio District. Fernando Flores, who is the TxDOT project manager that is uh, overseeing the development of this project um, for quite some time now. Um, Dale Pica looks like he's also here on the call. Dale Pica is in our traffic section. So he, his office uh, oversees a lot of the uh, ongoing traffic concerns or issues or complaints that come up. Dale Dale's very in tune with a lot of those type of uh, issues and things that come up. And then also with us before I turn it over to them is um, our uh, consultant. So because of the uh, workload we're unable to do things in-house with uh, state employees or textile employees. So we, we hire consulting engineering firms to perform a lot of this work for us now. And so we have Alliance Transportation Group who is uh, doing this study for us with uh, Clint Jumper is here on the call and Julia Coleman um, with ATG. So to kind of give me an idea, Ryan, how many, uh, this is open to the citizens, how many folks are in attendance today? Uh, we have our full council here, and then we have, um, it looks like, um, just offhand, we have about eight, about 300 people here. Uh, no, we have about eight citizens in attendance, and then, of course, um, uh, some may be participating via Zoom or just watching on our Ustream live um, within the city of Castle Hills. Clayton, we're also Great. recording this so that people can see it at a later time as well. Very good. And so just kind of something that, and Clint, and uh, Clint and Julie will touch on this in the presentation, but something to keep in mind, we, uh, due to the COVID situation, we, we, we're not going out and conducting in-person meetings, you know, whether it's public hearings or meetings. Um, 
And so as such, every time we have a project like this one, we're doing everything virtually. So everything that you see here today is online, but a more expanded version. It has more information, more data about the project. Specifically. So people at their leisure can go online and they can download and, and view anything you see here today, plus more. So that format has actually been working out really well for us over the past uh, six, seven months now. Um, we're getting more public involvement. We're getting more input. We're getting more people viewing it at their leisure and actually touching base with a lot of folks that typically aren't able to show up for that one or two hour window when we have the more, the more traditional brick and mortar type meetings. So this has been very effective to be able to uh, do all this virtually. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Clint. And uh, if you guys want to go through the PowerPoint, you have uh, prepared. For Thank you, Clayton. Yeah, if you guys will give me just a minute, I will share my screen. Um, I'm not able to do it, it says. That's something somebody can give me the access to share my screen. Yeah, they'll have to give you permission, it looks like. Okay, now it's working. And share it. And then I will start the presentation up as it takes over the screen. And you should see the presentation now. Is that coming through for everybody? Yes, sir. Great. <clears throat> so as Clayton said, my name is Clint Jumper. I'm the project manager with Alliance Transportation Group for this 410 at 281 San Pedro Operational Improvements. I'm hearing some background noise. If, if everybody could mute their mics or just double check for me. Maybe that'll keep it so everybody can hear. Appreciate it. So I've, this is a, basically a condensed version of what you'll see on the virtual public meeting that Clayton mentioned. As he said, there's much more information and details in the virtual public meeting. You can walk through it at your own pace um, and leave comments along the way as you go. So that I really recommend that everybody go there. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have a share your input slide that'll give a little bit more information on how to get to that. But we are gonna go through the project location, uh, project overview, and uh, kind of the reasons why we're doing the project, some proposed safety improvements, the travel time improvements you're going to see. And then I'm going to let it switch over to Julia Coleman, who's going to show the 3D visualization for us that we've that shows all the improvements along the project. Then I'll take back over and talk through the project funding and schedule. And like I said, show you how to share your input. So the project limits are along 410 from West Avenue to Broadway Street, and also along US 281 from 410 to East Nakoma Drive, and at San Pedro and 410. <clears throat> So there's a, a several concerns out here. There's a lot of safety concerns. There's been many uh, crashes and I'll show you another graphic on that in a minute with more detail. But over the four year period we've studied, there were approximately 3.7 crashes per day on average. There's also a lot of congestion. This, this section of 410 ranks number 46 in Texas top 100 most congested roadways. And there's operational concerns. There's backups along the main lanes and at intersections. And so our goal was really to help help that. And I think these improvements too, we're really excited about them and happy to present them to you today. Um, so we're gonna reconfigure ramps, we're lengthening and removing weaving merge segments and improving intersections and removing bottlenecks along the way with our suggested changes. As I mentioned, here's a little bit more detail on the safety concerns. You can see there are nine fatalities along through the four years that we studied. Uh, and these are the locations of the fatalities. And then you also see a hot map that shows where the, the mo more uh, crashes were in the red down to the lesser crashes along with the blue color. This slide shows the crash rates uh, for across the four years for the two different roadways as compared to their, uh, the statewide average for that type of roadway. So I'll show you an example here for 2015. There are 286,000 crash, 286 crashes per 100 million vehicles along 410. At the same time, the statewide average for interstates was 148 crashes. So you can see in each of these years, or both of these roadways, the crash rates were significantly higher. As far as congestion and operational concerns, the existing traffic on 410 in 2018, when we took the counts, was 296,000 vehicles per day. For 281, it's approximately 220,000. And our projections show that these are going to significantly increase uh, through 2045. This line represents the capacity of the existing roadways, so what they can handle. Once the, the amount of vehicles goes beyond this, 
you'll see significant congestion for multiple hours in a day. I wanted to just go over the project history a little bit. From 2016 to 2018, TxDOT conducted a feasibility study where they identified issues and developed a, a technically preferred alternative and then refined that with public input. There were two public meetings that had a significant number of attendees and comments. Right now, we're working through the schematic design and preliminary environmental study. So since 2018, we've been reviewing the concepts and doing analysis on them, completing more detailed roadway design and evaluating the environmental and community impacts. And also we're working to gather input from the public and stakeholders. I wanna talk about a few of the major safety improvements. Um, at all these locations, we're gonna increase the weave, merge and diverge distances. And these will, should reduce crashes between 10 and 30% based on our studies and, and data. We're also gonna barrier separate between the San Pedro bypass and the entrance ramp. And also improve safety at the San Pedro Avenue, which is anticipated to reduce crashes by approximately 10% on the southbound approach and 25 on the westbound approach. This is some information based on our study from the uh, how the traffic improvements, the, the speeds of the traffic through the project study. Uh, so as you can see in the existing condition compared to the build condition, there's improvement, but above the no build, it's, it's very significant improvements. So I'll go through an example here. Along westbound, as you can see here circled, from east of Broadway Street to west of West Avenue in the existing 2018 condition, it takes 12 minutes and 40 seconds in your peak hour to get through that segment. In our build planned condition, it would be four minutes and 14 seconds in 2025 after the project's open. And then in 2045, it'd only be seven minutes and 43 seconds. So you can see there's significant operational improvements. At this time, I'm gonna see if we can get Julia Coleman share her screen. Somebody can allow her access to do that and she can run the 3D visualization that takes a few minutes. Julia, are you still on? Yeah, there she is. Able to share your screen, Julia? We can't hear you. Give her just another second. Maybe they're just having trouble getting through it. I'm not showing that her audio is connected. Okay. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm sorry about that. We do have a, a great 3D visualization that I think we'll um, just have to, uh, this thing, I'm not sure what happened to my presentation. Sorry about this. It's on there, it's on there, Clint. You just have to click over to um, view options and click on Julia's name and you should see her, she's sharing her screen. Oh, okay, it's just me that can't see it, That's, okay. Mr. Jumper, if we disable your screen sharing, will hers come up as a primary? Uh, okay, I'll stop sharing. There we go. Uh, can you start it over for us, Julia? Good. That's close to the beginning. There we go. Sorry, that was my fault. Then I guess I was hanging on to it. <laughs> If you watch it through the virtual public meeting, there's also some uh, some voiceover.
can see in the bottom left of your screen how we're, where we are along the project. It's, it's stepping through each of the different ramps where we're reconfiguring. Any of the improvements are about separating the traffic out. So you have multiple separate exits that are separating traffic and keeping them uh, from having the conflicts and weaves that we were seeing in the existing condition. So, Mr. Jumper? Yes, sir. Um, is it possible for Ms. Coleman to connect her audio so that we can hear the narration? She sent me a chance that she was muted from your end. Let me see. Well, the narration, I guess, was removed from the video anyway. So if you go in the virtual public meeting, though, you can you can see it. She said it's not available on there. I can talk to him just a little bit. I didn't prepare for that this evening, but I can certainly if talk you, to you guys about what the changes are. If, if you wouldn't mind uh, going over the high points, and then mm -hmm. I'd also like to remind everybody this video is available on YouTube for you to watch at home. That's right, yes. So you can see here where she has it paused. Uh, yeah, why don't you pause? Clint, why don't you, when you get the key pick areas, just pause it and yeah. then and just talk about it. Okay. Julia, would you back up to Honeysuckle then? Yeah, let's back up to the, the key points that are going to be in Castle Hills. And if you could just narrate what's going on for us. Okay. Yeah. So at the beginning of the project here, we're doing a ramp reversal. And so right now where there's an entrance ramp, there'll be an exit ramp or where there's an exit ramp on the other side there, there'll be an entrance ramp. And the purpose of that is to balance the ramping as you move down the corridor um, and allow the vehicles to move on and off in a, a, just a better order so that the, the uh, capacity is better met. So that's the beginning of the project, what's going on there. And then Julia, if you'll pause it when you get up here to Honeysuckle. That's good. So we're keeping Honeysuckle open underneath and it allows full access here. Um, there's not too many other major improvements to the intersection. I think we're keeping keeping all of the, um, the movements available. Um, keep moving then, Julia. You can see here, we have an exit that's separated for Blanco and um, Northwest Military, and also for the San Pedro and the other streets down, down past San Pedro. And by separating out these movements, there's a significant backup right now from this, the existing San Pedro exit that'll all be on an over, overhead um, CD lane, they call them collector distributor. So, and then on the, on the um, westbound side, you can see we have a braided ramp here. So we still have a honeysuckle ramp that's going underneath, but a lot of the traffic that's on um, the frontage road there will go over it to eliminate that weaving. If you'll move up to the Northwest Military intersection, Julia, you can see it a little bit better. You can see there's the Blanco exit here that's elevated. And underneath it on the frontage road, the Northwest Military intersection comes up and we're, we're um, changing the intersection here to what we would call a green T, which allows the through movement to move through unobstructed. And then the left turns from the frontage road onto Northwest Military will have a, a basically a two cycle light with the, the left turns coming from Northwest Military wanting to get onto the main lanes. And so they'll have to wait less at this intersection, be more efficient. And so if you're coming south on Northwest Military, you can still get onto the freeway right here. Yeah, I guess one of the key things to note regarding Honeysuckle is if you're headed eastbound on Honeysuckle, you actually will have an entrance ramp here. Uh, Julie, if you could scroll just a little bit back to Honeysuckle and you kind of show how people that come up Honeysuckle, they want to get on the main lanes. They won't have to stop at a traffic signal. Right, with the green team. Yeah, so that's kind of what, what Clint's talking about. You'll be on this frontage road on the far right side coming down and then there's this little slip ramp that comes underneath, there you go. And then right there, you see that little barrier that he's talking about, that green T. You just stay behind that barrier, the traffic, there's no conflict and you just get on that entrance ramp. 
similar place where the Northwest military entrance is today. That's right. Miss, Miss, if you want to give us a second, let's go through the presentation and then we'll take questions from everybody. So I don't know how much more of the video you guys want to want to see. This is a two lane exit to San Pedro that um, that also serves several intersections down further uh, McCullough and Jones. -Maltzburg. I would take it all those way to San Pedro. Plant. Okay. So um, we readjusting the exit to Northwest Military. It's not changing the movement of it. It's just changing the way it's designed so that we can get these other lanes in here. And this two lane collector distribute, distributor for San Pedro carries over Blanco and allows to still have the same entrance movement from San Pedro underneath it. But it also goes to the outside there and the frontage road will come in between the main lanes and the ramp coming down. There's no longer an exit ramp here to San Pedro and that's where we're seeing a lot of significant congestion in the existing condition. And then the, the ramp coming in from San Pedro will have the option to go to the San Pedro intersection or to hit the San Pedro bypass, the existing bypass, and go up and over and go on down to McCullough and jones Maltzburg. And on the westbound side, we're adjusting this ramp here to give a, a further distance between the ramps, which is better for the merging on the main lanes. At the San Pedro intersection, there's going to be a triple left installed on this, this approach, on the eastbound approach. And the right turns coming southbound from San Pedro will have a dual right. It's, it's also separated so that in the left-hand turn lane, you'll be able to get onto the ramp. But in the right turn lane, you'll be staying on the frontage road. I think that's, that's probably good, Julia. Like I said, the entire video you can watch and back up and look at closer um, on the virtual public meeting. So if you'll stop sharing, Julia, I'll, I'll do it again. I'll share again and finish the presentation. Okay, can everybody see my screen again? Yes, sir. Great. So this project is funded, both federally and state funds, funds are included. The estimated construction cost is, um, for the 410 improvements we were just looking at is 54 million, and for 281 is 13 million for a total of 67 million in funding. So going over the entire project schedule, as we talked about earlier, we're in the schematic and design phase. We're right now, we have the virtual public meeting going on. It's going on until the 28th, so two more days. Uh, then in early 21 and through the spring of 21, we're gonna finish the final schematics and environmental clearance. Then TxDOT through 2021 and 2022, will work to obtain the right of way and relocate utilities. And then early 2023 is when our earliest anticipated construction date is. So as I said at the beginning, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to to see where you can go to leave your feedback and see the rest of the virtual public meeting. If you go online to text.gov and search I-410 at US 281, it should come right up as the site. And uh, I do wanna remind you that the comments are being received on that as a part of that official public meeting through October 28th, so this week. Well, thank you for your time and this opportunity to present to you today. I'll stop sharing my screen and presentation thank you perfect thank you so much for uh, the presentation we do have uh, a handful of citizens here that i imagine there are some questions <clears throat> would you be okay answering a couple of those to just uh, give some feedback and let us know everything that we think we're looking at i can certainly try <laughs> perfect thank you and uh, we might need uh, miss coleman to put her screen back up so we can uh, reference it specifically Mr. Apple, do you have any comments? Uh, no, Mayor, I don't. Okay. Um, 
we don't have an official sign up. So if anybody wants to ask a question, uh, please come on up to the microphone. Or is there a sign up? Thank you, Sergeant. We do have one there. Clint, Clint or Julia, can you go to the honeysuckle area? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, Ms. Tarkington. I'm Kathy Tarkington at 153 Trillium. Um, my family and I moved to Castle Hills in 1984. And at that time, 410 was only four lanes. We updated our house and put in double pane windows. But as the years have gone along and traffic's increased, it has gotten incredibly noisy. Now, Craig Bertolet, who used to live in the estates here in Castle Hills, and I guess he moved to the other side, he had a study of noise for decibel level back in, gosh, when Bill Martin, I believe, was mayor. But noise certainly has gotten a lot worse in the many years since then. So I'd like to see, especially adding more traffic and at putting these lanes closer to, to us citizens. I live a block inside Loop 410 on Trillium. So while it's not right against like Gladiola or some, a, a city, a street that literally is right against the freeway, we are noticing a lot more noise. And I'd like to see what can be done as far as a noise study and potential noise uh, walls, uh, some sort of barriers. I mean, cities like Houston and Dallas have walls to help with the noise. I certainly think Castle Hills is for that sort of thing now, especially with the addition of traffic. That's it. I can start this off, and I would assume Clayton or Richard or somebody may want to chime in on this. Yeah, I'll, I'll address it after you do. Okay, so in this area, we're not taking any right away. We're not expanding closer to any homes. Um, and so there, and there was a noise study done as part of this project, uh, and it, it focused primarily, though, on where we were adding or taking on right away um, and, or increasing that, that noise level. It did not suggest any, any additional walls in this area. Um, and so, or at all on the project, actually. Clayton, did you want to add to that? Yeah, so to answer answer the question, I guess, in an in a overall point of view, anytime we have a, a project that either adds lanes or is is um making operational improvements, we're adding what we call auxiliary lanes, which is this one. This one, we're not adding any traffic lanes, we're not adding any through lanes. So it doesn't meet that qualification requiring a noise study, but it's just a grade below it. And so because of that, Part of our environmental process, we do perform noise studies. And so those noise studies. Sorry. Yeah. And so those noise studies, what they do is they, 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 there's a right set criteria that has to be met to warrant some type of a, a way to mitigate the noise in some way, shape, or form. But the studies do, you do have to uh, project out traffic for 20 years. So it takes into account 20 years of traffic in the future. But there is a formalized federal and state process, you know, to meet the constructability or of a noise wall or whatever that mitigation measure would be um, to, to see if it's actually reasonable and feasible to build the wall. Sometimes in these highly urbanized areas, it is challenged um, to end up having that reasonable and feasible wall, because sometimes to mitigate a noise that's already maybe exceeding the levels that you can mitigate, you'd have to build a hundred foot tall wall or something, which is not reasonable or feasible. But we, we are going through that process right now on the, uh, the noise um, assessment of it. Thank you, Part of the concern for what you heard is that uh, the houses are very close to the road and with putting more traffic on the access road, there's a possibility that there's gonna be additional road noise that was not otherwise there. Yeah, so kind of on that, no, noise 
there's two elements to noise and it's really it's yeah traffic volumes but it's also speed so higher speed traffic generates a, a, a higher decibel than lower speed traffic so the main lanes have the higher speed traffic which is still a majority of the traffic yeah there's going to be an increase on the frontage road and some of these stretches of frontage roads than what's there today due to the changes in the ramps and the patterns that, that are the travel patterns of folks but it's lower speed traffic so it's kind of that I mean, it's not, hey, you're having 70 mile an hour traffic now diverted on these frontage roads. That's not the case. It's balancing some of those folks that want to be on those frontage roads today, but are stuck on the main lanes because of the way the ramps and the intersections are configured. This, is just, this project's kind of balancing um, that out to where the, the, the frontage roads will actually carry the lower speed traffic than what the main lanes do in the middle. Council, we have on to the Mr. Gregory. This plan is supposed to take into account the two and a half increase in traffic by 45. Is that correct? Remember wants to answer the I'm sorry. Uh, could you could you repeat the question? I didn't quite make it. It was some the proposed plan that you brought before us. Does this plan take into account the approximately two to two and a half times increase in traffic expected by 2045. Yes, sir. Okay. So as I was showing um, on the one slide where we talked about the the increases in traffic and then the, the decreases in travel time, that's with those higher traffic numbers. Uh, in 1980, the traffic was one fifth, approximately one fifth, what you project out for 2045. And yet there have been few, if none, sound barriers put up all during this time. They're desperately needed, especially for people south of the loop in this city. Uh, what is it that when you've had a, when you will have a projection four to five times increase of noise, there have been few, if any, sound barriers equal to what they have in Dallas and Houston put up. Yeah, so since since 1980, the regulations and, and the process for noise mitigation has changed. I mean, it changed. We follow the federal laws. Comparing San Antonio, or in your case, Castle Hills, to Houston or Dallas or Fort Worth is not comparing apples to or It's not apples to apples. So some of these other cities, they have other things in their development codes that require, say, when housing subdivisions go in, that those developers fund those walls or build those walls. So there's there's other things that come into play. TxDOT highway projects, um, you know, we follow that the federal process on whether the determination of that study shows, um, you know, there is a reasonable and feasible way to mitigate a noise a noise um, issue. And so that's that's the process, you know, that that is followed. You know, I know there's a stretch of homes here that has that real tall brick um, wall, if you will, as you lead over lead over there um, on the eastbound frontage road between Honeysuckle and Northwest Military. That type of a wall, you know, would be modeled in the noise model because that perform that actually performs as a noise wall today. It performs mitigation against the noise. And so when you when they build these models it actually replicates kind of the situation that's there today and what those noise levels are at what we call receivers that are behind the wall at the backyards of those of those adjacent properties. When that bridge was built, the traffic compared to what you project out in 45 was one quarter of what it is, what did you project it to be in 45? I don't see how that red brick wall, which was built by a private developer, is going to significantly help everybody going south okay. in mitigation yeah. noise. Okay, so the key thing here is you said everybody, how it helps everybody. The way the noise, the noise studies and the federal requirements, you cannot mitigate to help everybody. That's, it, it's the adjacent properties where these receivers are, you know, where it weighs into you know, whether you can mitigate it with some type of a wall, but a wall like that that's there today, it will show that it's performing 
in some way mitigating the noise. Um, it's, it's, sci it's a scientific process that goes through to show that because we, we, get, we get questions and, and, uh, and a lot of complaints over noise, as you can imagine, all over the place. And, and it's, a, it's a weekly um, deal that comes in complaint wise for people that lived along an inter interstate 10, you know, they bought a house. One gentleman, he's over, he's over, he's a mile away from interstate 10 and he calls repeatedly, you know, and there's, we can't build a 200 foot tall noise wall, you know, that would do anything to help, you know, so we, we, we feel, we feel a lot of those. And so that's why there's a, there's a, a process in place and that's what we kind of have to follow and adhere to, because if you could imagine if every time someone called and wanted a, a noise mitigation done, you know, it would really, we would be in the noise, noise wall building business and not the highway business anymore. So that's why we, you know, we really, we follow kind of what, what's going on here. But here, just know that we're, we're working through the, the noise analysis um, right now. Do you project a tax on a gallon of gasoline for, for highways is 38 and a half cents? With more people going to electric cars, but 2045, do you expect to have a cash crunch on further development of fixing these roads? That's something that the legislature has to do. I cannot comment on that. Thank you. Mr. May. Okay, I'm trying to understand this stretch uh, that you talk about at the front of the handout, which is remove eastbound entrance ramp from West Avenue to eastbound I-410 and replace with eastbound exit ramp from EB I-410 to Honeysuckle Lane. So you're really changing out one for the other. And this particular stretch on the right-hand side going east has exactly two businesses, unless I'm mistaken. And those two businesses are the Bank of San Antonio and Pate Dawson. Did you consult both of those entities? Um, for this plan, they've been notified, yes. They've been notified of, hey, here's a project, all the material, you know, the outreach material is out on this virtual open house website. Who did you speak with at the San Antonio Bank? No, we did, we did, not, we did not visit with them um, personally. The, the folks, so, so on projects, um, what we do is if we need right away from the adjacent property owners, like we have to purchase additional property, we will go and visit with them one-on-one -on -one, um, individually in that regard. And there's some situations where, okay, there's something really a big, big change. We're putting in a raised median or something or changing the access completely for, for, for an area, you know, then we'll, we'll have some one-on-one -on -one conversations here. We did not have one-on-one um, -on -one conversation with the, what is it, the Bank of Texas, I guess, sir. So are you telling me you did not consult with any representative from Pate Dawson or the San Antonio Bank? I'm sorry, what, what, what are we, what are, what are you trying, what are you, I guess I'm confused on what. A question, a direct question. Did you consult with a representative from either Pate Dawson, engineering firm, or the Bank of San Antonio? But no, I, mean, I don't. Uh, but I unless can confirm. You I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Clint. I can confirm that the bank was on the mailing list for the virtual public meeting. That's the only conversations I'm aware of with the bank. Pape Dawson does other roadway work in the area, and I'm, so they've been uh, just you know part of conversations with, on other projects that are adjacent to this one. So they knew more about it, but we didn't have any special meetings with either of those entities. Well, I'm just asking a simple question. Did you consult with the representatives or the owners of either of those two? No. Okay. So can you help me out in understanding how it is in the grand scheme of this new plan if you take out one of these exit ramps and replace with another, why is it better this way than leaving it as it is? So we were working to balance the ramps through the whole area along 410 so that you have an even exit and entrance pattern. 
that allows the traffic to merge and weave better and to, to not be so congested with all the different conflict points and, and safety is better as well. And so we were looking at how the ramps and traffic would balance and work through this whole area, not just for specific locations, but it's meant to make everything better and it's, it's working. And it's, and it's a dom it's, it's hard to describe, but it's a domino effect. Really, a lot of these changes down here are because they're upstream. So you work kind of from the downstream, which, I, which I'm referring to as San Pedro, changing the San Pedro entrance and then the exit. And once you start working your way back, you have to try to figure out a balance in kind of those ramp patterns. So this ramp, which is today eastbound, is an entrance ramp from was it West Avenue, Jackson Keller, which will now be the exit ramp for Castle Hills, if you will. So now you have one exit ramp that's for Honeysuckle and Northwest Military. So one of the things that we identified is, you know, and feedback that we received several years ago was, you know, identifying, you know, Castle Hills as Honeysuckle and Northwest Military, both eastbound and westbound. You know, you kind of have that same, you know, you kind of have the exit coming in for Northwest Military and then Honeysuckle. <clears throat> okay, I have a so most of us that come in on the eastbound 410 and come to our homes in Castle Hills, we exit so that we end up at West Avenue. And as we all know, there's a huge backup during rush hour. So with this new scheme, won't we simply be backing up the traffic one more exit further down the road, which would then be Honeysuckle? I don't, I'm not quite following you, but you said that you exit before West Avenue to be there? We exit typically on West Avenue for coming eastbound. Right. So anyone that lives in Castle Hills knows that right before you get to the HEB on West Avenue, there's a big backlog at uh, rush hour. So we get it. There, there's a backlog. But if you just switch out by closing that exit and moving it down, closer to Honeysuckle, aren't you simply going to be moving the backup further down and closer to San Pedro? No, it, what, it, what this is doing is it's splitting up a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the issues. One of the biggest issues is the San Pedro exit is so close to San Pedro and then the geometry of that ramp coming underneath and it's only one lane. When we kind of go through the 3D while ago, that that San Pedro exit is two lanes now. Blanco also has another exit as well. And you separate out the Northwest military and the honeysuckle exit. So what you're doing is you're unloading cars where they're really wanting to go as you kind of approach San Pedro, if you will. And then when we're unloading them, you saw that braided ramp situation. Then we're putting the cars that want to get on 410 back in. You have that entrance from Northwest military, for instance. So what this plan is doing is it's unloading and then reloading when you've got that opportunity to, to crisscross and not have as many conflicts um, with it and try to alleviate some of the bottlenecks and the backups that are occurring. So I wanna make sure I understood too, because we're not closing an, an exit that's upstream of West Jackson Keller. That exit's not a part of this project. Right. So, so you're, yeah, say that again, please. We're not impacting, we're not changing the ramp that's upstream of West and Jackson Keller, the exit ramp is in the same location. We're not touching that. That's outside this project limits. So tell me what it means when you say remove eastbound entrance ramp from West Avenue. What do you mean? So right here where we're looking, if you're coming along from West Avenue today, there's an entrance ramp. So a movement from the frontage road onto the main lanes. We're removing that and replacing it with an exit ramp to allow traffic to exit from the main lanes to the frontage road. It's in the so, same location. So you're gonna have more traffic that's gonna be dumped onto the access road right about where the bank is now. Is that roughly correct? I'd have to go look at where the bank is. Um, it's actually coming on past the bank. I'm looking now at the, the detail. You can actually look at these schematics on the virtual public meeting as well. And you can see where the movements will be. It looks like the exit will tie in past that, just just near um, Gladiola Lane is where the traffic will actually be able to move over. They really shouldn't be trying to turn on Gladiola. It's too close to the ramp in the exit point. And, and then the next point of reference is Honeysuckle Lane. 
And that is the crossing, one of the few crossings that go to the elementary school on the opposite side. Were there any studies done on how that will impact pedestrian traffic? We didn't do any pedestrian counts or, or we considered, you know, the access for pedestrians to make sure that it's there and it's safe and meets all the requirements, but we didn't actually do a study for pedestrians. We're not removing the traffic signal at Honeysuckle. Right. It's just traffic right. signal not going to be there. Okay, let me um, go further down from Honeysuckle. In this whole scheme, are you telling me that a person can follow that access road all the way down unimpeded to Blanco and make a right-hand turn with the new signal? No, there's a signal at Honeysuckle, so they could end up stopped at Honeysuckle. Okay. Could they go beyond Honeysuckle, go all the way through on the access road, winding up on Blanco and taking a right? They could, just as they, right. Yes. Okay. And then one last follow-up question on this segment. On the other side, the north side, where we've got two churches and the entrance area to a school, how will that access road be impacted by your plan? So from Northwest Military? From Northwest to Military to Honeysuckle. Honeysuckle, right. So there you go. So we're improving the connector that goes from Northwest Military to the Furnage Road by making the curve um, away. Like right now, it's a very fast curve and you can take it very quickly and come around there um, and then to tie into the frontage road. We're actually pulling that back so that there's more room for that um, weave to happen. And then from there to Honeysuckle, we're not changing the, the curb line in any way. We're only changing the way the lanes are configured there to, to allow that um, Honeysuckle ramp to come underneath the, the entrance ramp, the braided entrance ramp. Have there been any studies that would take into account the number of people coming from those two churches on Sunday or any other event night and after school? Our traffic studies are all based on uh, weekday AM and PM peak. So there's not a special study done for the church, but we did, we did observe traffic there and look at it on the weekends to make sure that we understood how that was working. But no study was done factoring the schools and the church. Is that correct? The school is probably during the AM peak, I would imagine. I don't know their school schedule, but so it'd be included in that. Yeah, so so for the school, it's captured just like we do on any project. And then the churches, because you know they're they're off peak for the most part, and they're treated as special events. So those you you really you don't factor in um, when you're doing your traffic models. Okay, thank you. Paul? Mr. Mr. Paul, can you use your microphone, please? I think Mr. Mays covered about all of it. The biggest thing is I would like to go back and have a better explanation. It's a little hard for me to understand the gentleman that's leading the troops out there with the uh, uh, the echo on the, on the But I am concerned about, if you proceed with this, the additional noise barriers are a must. Now, as mentioned by Mr. Gregory earlier, the ones, the red brick wall was not a noise barrier. That was a decorative situation built the states down there. It has nothing to do with a noise barrier. So I think that's an important thing that you can consider besides all the aspects of what Mr. Gray was talking about, ingress and regress and changing things. It seems like, you know, we're doing all this because mistakes were made at TxDOT uh, years ago, obviously, 281 and 410. Uh, intersection caused severe problems there and uh, at San Pedro. So obviously as a council, as citizens, we want to do everything we can to make sure we aren't inconvenienced due to the lack of uh, foresight back in those days. And that's, that's what we need to get some answers from. Uh, Mays uh, giving some good questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Mr. Isbrand? Um, Thank you, Mayor and Council, and thank you to everyone from TxDOT and your representatives for being here tonight. We appreciate it. I want to pick up um, 
I, I have a lot of questions and so I'll probably ask a few now and perhaps come back later with some more, but I wanted to pick up perhaps a little bit from where Mr. May left off. So if we can first look at uh, the discussion about adding the exit ramp just past West Avenue, replacing the entrance ramp that was there. Um, did I understand you correctly that, tra thank you on that graphic, traffic exiting there would not have the ability to cut across lanes to exit either the, ent to enter either the Pape Dawson property or the Bank of San Antonio property, is that correct? That's correct. Would the traffic exiting there have the ability to uh, come across the lane and turn onto Gladiola? Well, people can do movements like that. I wouldn't, that's not what we'd like to see. So the answer is yes, they would. They could. They could. No physical barrier preventing that. Thank you. I, the, yeah, that's, thank you. That's, I, I think, what I'm, I'm looking for, the clarification. So then the good news for anyone wanting to get to Bank of San Antonio or Pape Dawson is you'll be able to just cut down Gladiola, go down to uh, Jackson Keller, cut back across West Avenue and come back around. So aren't we, don't we risk putting a lot of traffic onto a residential street with that? You don't have any barriers there? I suppose if, if somebody wanted to do that, it sounds like they could from, from what you're saying. I'm, I'm not that familiar with the area back there uh, and the cut throughs that are available. Okay. I, do know, I do know that if we, we've maximized where we can place that ramp based on the, the main lanes and the requirements that FHWA has and also how close it is already to Honeysuckle Lane. So moving the ramp or adjusting that, that tie in point to the frontage road would make it very difficult for the intersection to operate if we got it much closer. That's where we were focused, not so much on what kind of uh, unusual movement someone could make to get to the bank, but how it operates with the frontage roads. Right, and yeah. I appreciate that. And I think what our concern is the traffic volume that comes down our residential streets, which I wouldn't call unusual movement if there is the ability to turn right there. Let me continue and ask, um, what kind of traffic study have you conducted or can you tell me what is the volume of traffic that exits Loop 410 eastbound uh, to the Northwest Military Drive exit on a daily basis? I think Julia may have those numbers pulled up, but you may just have to give her a minute. We're anticipating a lot of detailed questions on traffic volumes for each ramp. Yes, I'm working on pulling those up now. Thank you. Question was eastbound to Northwest Military. Correct. So that daily volume is about, I think, is 22,550. So 22,000 cars a day are exiting. And that's there. our projected um, in 2025. Okay, so let's just say 20 give and take, give or take. So do I understand correctly from this design that then if you want to get to Northwest Military, you would now have to exit that exit ramp just past West Avenue, remain on the access road, and then go up to Northwest Military? That is the correct way to get to Northwest Military and also that you could go through there and get onto the back onto the main lanes. The majority of the exit I think that you were asking about was going to Blanco, the majority of the traffic. So you haven't done any kind of study on what portion of that traffic exiting there turns on to Northwest Military? We have those movements and that's included in the study and in the traffic projections where okay. the movements would go. That's, that's part of the reasons we're adding the other exits here is to, to break that traffic up because there is a significant amount of exits and access through here. 
So it was a, it was a real challenge to make all these work together, but, but it's a, I think it's a good solution. So giving it the benefit of the doubt, or just for argument's sake here, that half of that traffic, half of that, half of those 20,000 cars exiting there are going to go to Blanco and the other 10,000 cars are going to go to, to Northwest Military. That still means that the intention here is to put 10,000 more cars on the access road between West Avenue and Northwest Military going eastbound through Castle Hills. Is that correct? No, sir. Julia, would you please uh, give him the numbers for those different movements? When doesn't Blanco have its own exit? It does now, yes. Okay. Blanco has its own exit. San Pedro has its own exit. The honeysuckle traffic is not very heavy. It's very low volume, and the demand there is very low. So it's really just predominantly Northwest military traffic and honeysuckle traffic destination that's really going to be using that exit. Have you um, conducted a traffic count on the vehicles that in, currently enter the entrance ramp eastbound from West Avenue? And what would the, be the vehicular count on that? Wait on Joey to pull that up. So existing is, is 2018 counts on that ramp. And eastbound entrance ramp from <laughs> West Avenue is. <laughs> Is about is about um, eighty six hundred in twenty twenty five. So then the intention here would be for those eighty six hundred vehicles to remain on the access road further through Castle Hills until they can um, enter farther to the east. Is that correct? No, no, that's not. That's not. So, so trying to make rough assumptions is okay from a high level standpoint, but when you when they develop the traffic models, what you're doing is when you go from an existing configuration to a proposed, you, know, you have to disperse the traffic because not everybody that was using that ramp today will be using it anymore, you know, because you got to disperse them kind of where, where they may be using other entrance ramps also. You know, there may have been people because now you made other changes to some other entrance ramps, they maybe were driving all the way back through the neighborhoods, like y'all pointed out, coming back around, getting West Avenue and jumping on that entrance ramp, that are no longer going to do that because they can come out honeysuckle and get on that entrance ramp at Northwest Military without having to go through a signal. You see, what, you see, that's the thing, you know, you, there's a lot that goes into it to make those. So trying to, on the fly, make big picture assumptions, which is always a great starting point for sure. But You've got to factor in there's people that are using that intern tramp today that really only are using it because they're being forced to because it's maybe further or there's a bad queue at the other ones as you get north of here so or east of here so you got to figure out where that where those folks you know start changing their travel patterns based off of the proposed geometry and the other changes that are being made on our corridor so like with this like it's hard to isolate it as hey if you change something here why can't you just do it? Well, the second we change anything here, the whole the whole project, we have to kind of completely reconfigure it. And I promise you from the feedback we, we received uh, several years ago, we took to heart on not closing Honeysuckle and keeping it through. And we did. We held that as, you know, that this is what we had. And we had these other options that we've kind of looked at, but they were all very um, – they had challenges to them and they're expensive. I mean, what we're proposing today is not the cheapest thing, but it is effective and it does accomplish, you know, a good balance of providing mobility, providing the access, improving the access to areas like this exit ramp here from the east. I mean, there's a lot of folks that work over in the, in the medical center and at USAA, they live in this area and this exit ramp is perfect for them. And that, you know, th those are the things that we've learned in doing this, studying this for several years. So there are some great trade-offs, positive, and there's some that, you know, as someone mentioned a while ago, inconvenient. But at the same time, it's that balance of trying to improve the congestion and the safety along this corridor. I don't know if you saw that slide with all the crashes along here. The incidents that occur out here and breakdowns of vehicles and just the simple little crashes that occur create ripple effects, not only for congestion, but for other crashes. I mean, this is... This, this stretch of 410 is very busy, very popular. I mean, as you can imagine, you're between Interstate 10 and Interstate 35, and you're within 
a mile and a half of an international airport. Very busy, active area. And so trying to balance everything, the solution that we ultimately came up with after receiving input over the several years, it's kind of, is it perfect? No. Is it going to solve everything? No. Is it going to have some trade-offs? Yes. And so that's what I just want to kind of folks keep in mind because you're asking some really great detailed questions, really great questions. And uh, I know if I was in your shoes, I'd be wanting to know as much as I could as well. But I just want to kind of make sure, you know, paint a big picture of, you know, kind of how we take this approach. Well, so I hope that helps a little bit. It, it does and I appreciate that. I understand that this is a very busy tra uh, traffic area. We all, we all know that. Um, our obligation though is to the residents of Castle Hills and this is a residential community that's being impacted here by this, which is why I asked these questions. So I, I, I think what you say is I'm, I'm looking at a, a big picture uh, suggestion on what you're counting all the traffic or whatever. All that I'm simply trying to understand here is how much more traffic will be on the access roads. And let's just use the one, the one going eastbound here between West Avenue and Blanco. How much more traffic will be on those roads? And surely with all these studies that are done, there is some kind of projection or analysis that TxDOT does that could give me that answer. So there's a schematic on the virtual public meeting that includes traffic numbers for this area for the projected years. And you, you can and, easily and see all these numbers. Are you able to tell me what those numbers are? Yes. So through the honeysuckle intersection in the eastbound direction. Going eastbound from West Avenue to either the, the entrance ramp that will be built there or to Blanco, however you'd like. But I'd like to understand what the traffic count would be between West Avenue and past honeysuckle and the estates area. Sure, okay. sure. So daily volume number, so that's the entire day in 2025 is 16,250 through vehicles for that eastbound movement. And in 2045, it's 22,800. I don't have existing on this layout. Julia, you might be able to help me with what's going through the intersection today. Sarah, it takes me a second to pull up, but I will okay. type it up. But our, our detailed VISA models analyze the operations of these movements and how it's going to work, and they show that it will, it will be acceptable operations here. I, I think it would be very helpful to the city to understand what those numbers are. Um, my last question, because I don't want to uh, hog the, the podium here, but I would like to ask a question about going westbound now on um, uh, 410. You're moving the exit ramp to West Avenue further to the east. Where exactly would that exit ramp be if it's no, where it is, is no longer currently located? Would it, be bef would it be east of Honeysuckle? Yes. It'll and be east. So that exit will be Honeysuckle and West Avenue. OK. So. Um, I guess I'll probably get the same answer, which is you can't tell me, but I'd like to know what the traffic count is exiting West Avenue, because what I'm hearing you say is that you're going to put more vehicles now on the access road there in front of one of our public schools, which sits right there on the access road, which begs the question I think one of the other council members raised about pedestrian safety, about traffic congestion, about, I think, pollutants, and you've already said that uh, there's, uh, I, I, don't, I don't think you've said whether there's been an environmental assessment of that. Can you help me understand the impact there? So, give, so go ahead. yeah, go ahead, Clint. I was gonna say, I can give you the, the projected numbers that are coming through Honeysuckle on that road as well, uh, on that, that approach, does that help you? It would, but I'd also like to know how much traffic is exiting on on the West Avenue ramp now. Today? Yes, sir. Okay, Julia, you'll have to be looking at it while I give you these numbers. So in 2025, our through movement at Honeysuckle in the westbound direction is anticipated to be 17,900. And in 2045, 24,950. Julia, did you get to those existing numbers yet? Yeah, and are you talking about the exit? So we have the peak hour AM and PM for existing. 
Oh, you don't have the ADTs to compare? Correct. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand if there was an answer there. She, she doesn't have a, the same type of volumes that I'm talking about. So on our, on our schematic, we show, do you say something, Clayton? Yeah, so, so I guess what, this is what's complicated about, you know, trying to lay out numbers. For instance, today, if you're on Northwest Military and you wanna get on 410, to get on a 410 going westbound, you have to go through Honeysuckle, right? So today you have the Northwest military traffic going through honey, Honeysuckle, right, as well. So that's kind of that, you kind of, it's, it's hard to explain. It's, it's a very complicated area. Yeah. Because I mean, it, baffled, it baffled us and we had, you can't imagine how many times and iterations we went over trying to trying to work out the balance on the ramps and, and volumes and and uh, figuring out the configurations because of course the AM is different from the PM, you know. So like some of these numbers where we're talking daily traffic or or in a day, you know, is not really what you analyze. You you analyze for the morning and you analyze for the the afternoon peaks and not a full day, you know. So when you hear ramp numbers of a full full day, you know, it really doesn't it doesn't tell us, you know, a complete story of what you're trying to analyze. You know, you analyze the AM patterns are different in the morning versus in the PM. So like, for instance, a school, this school, you know, is a more, more of the schools are tied to the morning peak and not really the afternoon because the schools, especially an elementary school when they're getting out earlier than say a high school. So, you, you know, those are taken into account that yeah, in the afternoon that the peak occurs after you know the elementary school is is uh, is closed. So uh, I'm sure I understand, and I'd like to. So how are you taking into account that it's morning school? Morning peak? I mean, there isn't the reality that you're more traffic on that access road in front of the school, and whether it's in the morning or the afternoon, that's used as a a crossing under Honeysuckle for children who live south of 410, um, as well as my question still about the environmental impact of all these cars with all these fumes sitting at these red light, at the red lights. And if you're putting more cars on the road, probably more congestion there um, that these children are being exposed to. Has sure. the uh, impact been done on, on uh, related to the school? So, so regarding, I guess I'm hearing something about fumes or something with, with that and, you know, people sitting in a stoplight. Well, see, so, so if you, you, you compare like when you're doing this, as far as like air quality goes, you know, you've got how many cars sitting in congestion daily, higher volumes of them on the main lanes and the frontage roads. And then you have the incidents and the crashes that occur where, you know, some of the feedback we received is, you know, frustration with, hey, when there's a breakdown, or there's a crash, everybody then starts diverting to the frontage roads and cutting through neighborhoods and, you know, and going through this area on the frontage roads. And so the project, you know, getting people moving and getting more vehicles kind of moving improves the safety, reduce the congestion, which has the added benefit of improving the air quality through the area when you're able to reduce the congestion. And so those higher volumes and getting that congestion, you know, reduced versus, you know, the smaller volumes that are on the front of those are at a stop uh, at a traffic signal, you know, you kind of weigh the balance between the two in that regards. But I think so I mentioned it earlier, um, the traffic signal at Honeysuckle will have all the pedestrian amenities to it um, as far as being able to cross, you know, and have ample time for them to cross that as we do with all of our intersections um, that are signalized accommodate pedestrians in that regard in the same manner. Okay. One last question on this. So you were talking about the need to space out exit and entrance ramps. What is the need to space out or move to West Avenue exit? Jake, it's kind of it, cutting it, it, Don't go ahead, Clayton. Sorry. Yeah, it just propagates. It kind of propagates as you try to space out the exits. What, what you have. What you have is you have you have so many intersections upstream or east of 
east of Castle Hills. And the biggest draw, of course, is the 281 direct connectors. Then you have set, you have McCola, Jones Mossberger, San Pedro, Blanco, Northwest Military. So within a mile and a half, you have six demand centers, if you will. So well, what happened and what's happening is they're just overloaded. You know, the ramps over to them are just overloaded. So revising these ramping patterns unloads, if you will, the folks and gets them more directly to their destinations than where they are today. Because what's hard to capture when you do your existing traffic counts is people are diverting because they can't get there. So, for instance, most of you probably, if you drive eastbound on, on 410, this what exit ramp is always backed up underneath the bridge up on the main lanes, it's San Pedro. Well, come to find out, people learn over time and say, hey, I'm exiting whatever, Northwest Military, and they're headed over to Blanco, and they're just going down, making a ride right down Blanco and getting into that, sub, getting into that development. Well, they're just waiting to go through, through Blanco to get over there. So there's people that have consciously change their travel patterns, you know, because of the things that have been, you know, the patterns that they develop are because of recurring issues. Um, and so that's one of the things that the need for changing these ramps is you're trying to balance out where people are wanting to go along here. It, it, it's tough. It's tough with a lot of needs and a lot of, um, a lot of issues all along the corridor um, and trying to balance that. And of course, trying to balance, you know, what we're doing through Castle Hills is something that we have been very cognizant of. And it's something that we do know, you know, that we're trying to balance and do the best we can with what we're able to do to help balance it out for as many people that use this corridor and live in this corridor, do business in this corridor as we can. And so that's, that's the, that's the, you know, that that's the challenge that we've been pressed with and we're trying to balance as much as we can, but we're not, we know we're not going to be able to satisfy every single need along here. And there are going to be some needs that are not going to be completely satisfied or addressed. And those will be some of those trade-offs, but, you know, getting people kind of moving out of congestion and getting, you know, improving the safety along all these roadways um, is really one of the things that, you know, it's, is good and promising to see out of a project like this and um, really getting the support of the city of Castle Hills um, would, would really help kind of go a long way and helping us kind of get this project across the finish line. All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Joyce, if you don't mind, I want to try to get some of the citizens to move forward a little bit because they've been sitting here with us patiently. Uh, we have Ms. Moretta Scott. Thank you. Can you hear me with my mask on? Okay. Okay, I have some questions. My name is Loretta Scott. I live at 207 Prince Drive. And uh, to give you a heads up, I was on council when this was brought to us before and you were planning on closing Honeysuckle. Sitting here listening to y'all talk about um, all the calculations you put into, I think there might be a miscommunication. That happened. The city, we were very against, if this will help, we were very against closing Honeysuckle because we stressed to you what a major artery it was between our city connecting the north part to the south part and how integral it was to our city. I think some people misunderstood that it was a major thoroughfare because looking at the plan now, we now have an eastbound honeysuckle exit and we have a westbound honeysuckle exit. And I think I can speak for myself and a lot of other citizens in the fact we do not want a honeysuckle specific exit off of 410 because of the amount of extra traffic that's gonna bring. Honeysuckle to the city of Castle Hills is almost considered a residential street. It connects our residential areas to our city hall and to one of our elementary schools. But when we think honeysuckle, we think residential. Um, from the numbers you're seeing of cars that typically are getting on the West Avenue on-ramp, number one on page 13, presentation you can't see but I, I have it here that you're getting rid of that on ramp there just past West Avenue heading east and the number that I heard quoted was 8,600 cars a day get on there now they won't they'll travel down well I guarantee you we don't even have 8,600 residents in Castle Hills much less that many that would need to go to Honeysuckle Lane 
So I think somewhere there was a cross communication that somewhere at TxDOT you felt that the city of Castle Hills was saying that honeysuckle was a major point of entrance and exit to the city. No, it's a residential street as far as we're concerned that just connects our north and south together. So having that exit that's bringing all of those cars past the bank, there's absolutely no commercial businesses um, there on the south side of 410 heading east. Now they're exiting and getting on to 410, they're exiting onto that access road that is all residential. There's no commercial businesses for those cars to go to. And on the other side, now they're exiting westbound before Honeysuckle. So everyone that wants to get off to go to West Avenue is gonna have to cross through the Honeysuckle intersection, that light, before they can get to West Avenue by closing that West Avenue exit ramp. So basically what TxDOT is doing now, in my opinion, and perhaps the opinion of others, has turned Honeysuckle into a major intersection. Do you think maybe we have more traffic going there than we really do? We don't. As far as I'm concerned, Honeysuckle can just be a little place through there that we, we go through, but not a major traffic area. And I think the problem is gonna be is that is the only place our students from Castle Hills Elementary to have to cross as pedestrians south to go home. And then south, we have Lee High School that has several magnet programs, the STEM Academy, the Northeast School for the Arts, and the International School of America. Those are teenagers or high schoolers. There's no parking on their campus. So they, a lot of them are walking. If they do not have cars, which they don't, they have to stay after school for activities. They are walking from Lee High School and quite a few of them live north of 410. They are crossing there at Honeysuckle. The more traffic at Honeysuckle, the more we're waiting for a disaster, either with high school students, middle school students that go to STEM Academy at Nimitz that might have to walk home north of 410, or any of our elementary students that have to walk south from Castle Hills. So I think what maybe TxDOT misunderstood is Honeysuckle is not a major vehicle um, intersection for the city of Castle Hills. It's a major residential connection. So that's my biggest concern is that is really the safest place for anyone that's adults, teens, children to cross from the north side of the city to the south or vice versa. And by what you're doing here, by having a Honeysuckle exit east and a Honeysuckle and West Avenue exit going west is just increasing the amount of traffic that's going through that Honeysuckle intersection. I wanted to bring that to your attention because I think it is, it's going to be, have horrible consequences in the future because I think you're misunderstanding what that honeysuckle, honeysuckle intersection is actually. And then I have one other question. I hope I'm not on a, on a clock because I have one other question. If you could move over to Northwest Military, I have a question there. I want you to picture if you're on Northwest Military and you're heading south, southbound, can you go on Northwest Military southbound and get onto the access road to Blanco? When you're done with construction, if I'm on Northwest Military and I'm heading south, will I have the ability to access the Blanco, the access road to get to Blanco? No, you need to come down through Honeysuckle and back around or, or find another way around. Okay, I find that unacceptable as well. If I cannot take Northwest Military and have access to Blanco Road, that is gonna push more traffic through our surface residential streets, whether they're trying to reach Blanco and they cut through a section of town we know as the edge, which is already fraught with cut through streets. All of the streets on the edge are already complaining with excess traffic between Northwest Military and Lock Hill Selma. This is gonna make it even worse even worse. I was a mom that had a bus stop with eight students on one of those cut through streets and we had cars going 30, 40 miles an hour down our street every morning while I was gathering eight kids waiting for a bus. We had a stop sign and it didn't even stop them. So you're going to increase that amount of traffic through these quote unquote cut through streets all along the edge, force them to cut over to Lock Hill Selma to get to Blanco Road on one side or they're gonna to have to cut down what's now Lemonwood. It's Carrollwood, turns into Lemonwood, go by our city hall, turn on to Lock Hill Selma, which is between our fire department, our police department, and an elementary school to turn on to Honeysuckle 
to get over to the access road to go to Blanco. So that's gonna back up traffic that's gonna impact our city services, the ability that for ambulances, fire trucks and police cars to get to Blanco. And it's gonna impact, there's more traffic there. And when that school's in in the morning and getting out in the afternoon and they have after school activities too, it's just gonna bunch up. There's no way that it is a good idea to limit our access to the access road from Northwest Military. I will see you some great ideas. I love the flyover to San Pedro. I love some of the reconfiguring there at Northwest Military. But if we cannot access the access road to get to Blanco from Northwest Military, that is a horrific idea. Um, those are really my biggest concerns about this problem. There's some good things, but making Honeysuckle Lane a major exit in both directions and not allowing us to be able to access Blanco Road from southbound Northwest Military, neither of those are are gonna work well for our city. It's gonna increase a lot of traffic through our surface streets. Um, I drive these streets every day and I know everyone here does too. And I think a lot of people would agree with me. Thank you so much for answering my questions. And I hope you seriously take it into consideration because Honeysuckle is not a major intersection. It's a residential street that just happens to cross Portland. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Mc, uh, Ms. Scott, Ms. McLinn. Good evening, council members from TxDOT. Thank you for joining us tonight. Amy McLenn, I live at 105 Villa Ann Street. I am quite disappointed with these revised plans. Um, I too was on council when this originally came up in December of 2017, January of 2018. Um, I use all of these exits. This is basically my circle. If you take a compass and draw it, I use every single one of these exits. Like you said, I know how to use them if the traffic is backed up. I know which exit I want to take. I have alternate plans. And, and so I'm intimately familiar with the way all of these things work. And I love some of your ideas, but I, I will ditto what Mrs. Scott said um, about Honeysuckle and about Northwest Military. And I was trying to submit a comment online today so that you would have it by the deadline. And every time I tried to submit to the virtual um, meeting comments, it was telling me I was a spammer. So what I'd like to do is read my comments, and I have also emailed them to TxDOT, but just out of the abundance of caution that my comments have been received, I would like to read them. Um, as I said, I'm very disappointed with the plans and that I was on council when this came up before. Um, we objected to the closure of Honeysuckle for numerous health, safety, and practical reasons, which were set forth in a resolution that the City Council of Castle Hills sent to TxDOT back in January of 2018. While Honeysuckle is not closed on the current plan, and I'm very thankful for that because it is like a huge artery that connects our city after we were bifurcated by 410. Um, we were told before that Honeysuckle had to be closed to have that West Avenue exit for the health and safety of of the project, that it was a safety issue. So I'm really curious that we can keep that West Avenue exit ramp now and keep Honeysuckle open when we know that it is a huge pedestrian and bicycle area. Um, so it's fascinating that it's okay now, but it, it wasn't okay before um, when we consider all the safety issues with this project. I really worry about people coming off of that exit and speeding through the light at Honeysuckle when I'm trying to, when my child, my fifth grader is walking home from school because I live inside the loop and we do go to that elementary school and people will run that light. I know that we could run all kinds of scenarios, but, but as residents here, we see the crazy things that people do to get where they want to be. And, and I know that that's going to happen right there. Um, honeysuckle, like I said, is the only surface artery in the middle of our city that leads to two, that leads to one of our two public schools and to all of our city facilities, including our fire department, our police department, and our city hall, and our commons. Um, there is pedestrian and bicycle traffic in this area that does not seem to be considered in this plan beyond the normal crosswalks, which at Honeysuckle, the lights hardly ever work. Um, 
In fact, there seems to be a complete lack of understanding of the amount of pedestrian tra traffic along the entire 410 corridor. If you have, have walked or sat or looked at anything from McCullough all the way to West Avenue, we have a huge amount of pedestrian traffic in this area that doesn't seem to even be considered in this plan. Uh, there's so much commercial business and so many hotels and restaurants that there really is um, a need to have and, and to address multimodal transportation along this corridor. In fact, what I find really interesting is that I was sitting in a TML um, class and they, there was a presentation about a, a highway project in Dallas and it was in the Park City Southern downtown area and that area was given three different proposals one that had an emphasis on pedestrian safety, one that had an emphasis on business and commercial activity, and one that had an emphasis on, on uh, traffic efficiency or increased, um, increased commute times. And I find it very interesting that in San Antonio, we are never given these options. I know that several, count, uh, several aldermen have mentioned sound barriers and how Houston and Dallas get these things. And it's really becoming a little disheartening that we don't ever see these considerations in San Antonio and in the small communities that are, are found in San Antonio. The current plan includes a reworking of all the entrances and exits that I don't believe is going to fix congestion the way you think it is. I think it's going to shove congestion to different areas. It's going to shove a lot of traffic onto our access roads and residential areas, which is going to increase noise and pollution, which you've already heard that argument, but I will reiterate it. There's no provision for sound barriers. I went back and looked at the 2016 comments from the December open house and several residents asked that please, would TxDOT please consider some sort of noise um, noise abatement for the projects that were being considered. I believe this plan will move the fatalities to other places. They're not gonna be on the highway, they're gonna be on our access roads. I've been rear-ended twice right in front of North Star Mall, so I know what you're talking about. People aren't paying attention and there's a lot of congestion. So I appreciate the things that you're trying to balance, but I, I estimate that the improvement in commute times isn't really worth the risk to personal life or the, the cost of this project. Uh, none of these changes really fix the fact that the flyovers at 281 and 410 and the flyovers to some extent at I-10 are the major, they're the beginning of this problem. And with some pretty simple solutions, that might be a nice, nice place to start before we do all this other work that just seems to be big band-aids to me. Thank you um, for listening. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Ms. McLean. Uh, next we have uh, Bonnie Hopke. Thank you, Bonnie Hopke, 111 Amerson. I also, like Ms. McLinn, live on, and Ms. Tarkington, live on the south side of 410. Um, the exit ramp based on, the new exit ramp for Honeysuckle, based on what you just said, is going to be less than a block from Honeysuckle. And there's a light right there at Honeysuckle. So I'm not sure what is being accomplished other than A, people running through the light at 50 something miles per hour as they're getting off of the exit road, or backing up onto the exit ramp because of the light at Honeysuckle. I totally understand and hope that people will not try to get over to Gladiola. I'm not convinced, but I'm also concerned based on not being able to, people not being able to get onto West Avenue, being put on that access road, and I'm trying to get out onto the access road from Gladiola. It is bad enough right now with the limited, um, traffic on the access road that sometimes you just cannot get out. And the line of sight on, from that road, from Gladiola onto the access road is such that you're halfway, you pretty much have to almost be halfway into the first lane in order to see if there's any traffic coming. So the line of sight already is horrible. And what 
by, by eliminating the entrance road at West Avenue, you have now forced everybody that comes down Jackson Keller, comes down West Avenue, whether you know northbound, southbound, whatever direction West Avenue goes, I have no clue. But they're now all coming on the access road because they can't get on anywhere else. They can't get on eastbound 410 anywhere else other than at Northwest Military. Um, I agree with everybody that had said, if you can't get to Blanco from Northwest Military, you once again just cut off a piece of the city. We now will only have one way honeysuckle to get from the north to the south side. And then again, whether you're south side or north side, all traffic going through residential neighborhoods. Once you get further on down your, your St. San Pedro, all those things at San Pedro, all they're doing is helping businesses. There is nothing in your plan that considers the residents and the residential properties along 410. And I agree what you've done is maybe taking taken accidents and backed up traffic off of 410, but you just put those accidents and backup traffic into residential areas. And that's one thing that I am, I am upset that it doesn't seem to have been a great consideration of what is being done to the residential areas of Castle Hills. Yes, you left Honeysuckle open, but you closed off every other access that the city has to the others from north to south, south to north. And I, I will be submitting my com additional comments that I was taking as I was sitting there online. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hopke. Uh, Ms. Grace Delgado. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I live on 106 South Garden View, and we were impacted the last time TxDOT um, did some renovations in this area. Basically, we as residentials um, on, north, on South Garden View can no longer turn left from Northwest Military onto our street, nor can we leave our street and turn left onto Northwest Military. So I, either way, we can't come in directly. We have to do the light um, and turn around. What I noticed is that since y'all made those modifications, um, there's a lot more traffic that is being directed into Castle Hills. It's much like you had said that they're trying to figure out any, any and other ways to get to wherever they need to go. And we had also had um, mentioned that maybe what you need to do is put in turnarounds at Northwest Military. And at, for one point or another, you said you were not able to. I've seen y'all put turnarounds in in existing areas. One I'm kind of thinking about right now, I think it's a Blanco in 1604. There was not a turnaround there before and now you put it in. I feel like if you put in the turnaround there at Northwest Military, it might alleviate a lot of traffic coming into our Castle Hills area. There's a lot of people who will come in and they'll, they'll exit Northwest Military and they realize that they can't get anywhere. So they have to do the, they have to do the light and do the turnaround and go back on the Northwest military. And he, sometimes they, they are coming from the exact direction that they just came from because there is no turnaround. So if you're going to go through all these renovations and all of this construction, I would like for you to take great consideration into putting a turnaround there on Northwest military and even perhaps incorporating much like the ladies had suggested before, maybe incorporating a turnaround or some kind of ramp onto, to, to, to Blanco, because all that, again, is what's happening is all of this construction is bringing more people into our city, trying to any way to get out of it. Again, they're just looking for that leak of water to just try to leave this area because they exited the wrong exit. Or as you mentioned before, there's bottlenecks. They don't want to wait. They're exiting um, from 281 and they're, they want to go to San Pedro, but it's too much. So instead of going to San Pedro, the next big major street, of course, is Northwest Military. But now that there's no turnaround, now they're actually having to come into our city. So 
I just believe that all the considerations should be done by tech stop before again, we're just all of this billions and millions of dollars are being wasted for nothing and we're gonna have to redo this thing all over again in another 20 years. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Delgado. Uh, Mr. Dennis Gruhonk. Hi. Uh, I, I think this, uh, I, I have uh, two things. And the uh, first thing I think has been said by at least a couple of people, but I wanted to kind of reiterate with it. Uh, if uh, for TxDOT, if they, if they would go back and look at uh, how this uh, kind of West Avenue San Pedro uh, corridor was set up before they did their changes, they're, they're gonna see that there was uh, by going uh, east, there was an exit to get to onto Blanco. And then after that, there was one to get onto San Pedro. And then coming west, if I remember correctly, it was the same thing. There was an exit to get onto San Pedro, and then there was one to get onto Blanco. And I think uh, if he would go back and look at that and see if he could make it work, uh, I, I think it would go a long way to keep uh, uh, excess traffic off of the feeder roads. And that's probably why it was designed that way originally. Uh, it seemed like it'd be a lot uh, simpler to, to go that route. The, uh, the other point that I wanted to make, and I think this came up in uh, a TxDOT meeting uh, back when uh, uh, Grace mentioned about all that fiasco with uh, military and all this excess traffic kept coming on military to try to turn around. But uh, one of the comments that was made back then, and it seemed like it was shrugged off uh, by the TxDOT engineer at the time, is uh, the TxDOT doesn't seem to be very good with signage. And that's uh, all the way from, you know, signage that's kind of billboard type, you know, that you look up and you see while you're driving to, uh, you know, painting on the, on the roads, you know, when uh, way before the exits start coming up and, and all. And I, I think if you guys would kind of step back and look, look at certain situations and before you want to spend, you know, I don't know, $10 million, you know, and tearing stuff up, you know, if you could see if uh, signs, better signs, uh, might might help. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, if we don't have anybody else, I know Mr. Joyce has been waiting very patiently. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the folks have said most of the things that I've had in mind. I re don't really have a lot to add, but I do have a question or three, if I may. Uh, with respect to the gladiola question, uh, I was wondering if there might be a way to, um, you know, sometimes when you exit a highway, you see a sign, no entry onto such and such a street. And there might be some vertical bars or whatever you guys call them that prevent folks from veering quickly over to one side to, to do just that. Uh, that's one question. And the other thing is, as Ms. Hopke mentioned a moment ago, when you're trying to get out of Gladiola, it's really, really hard to see. So if there could be some sort of a, a warning sign or, or some sort of traffic calming, I don't know what, where that would be appropriate, but some, some way that folks would know that there's a street up ahead and they can't see you very well as they're trying to exit that street. Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask gentlemen is with, re with respect to the discussion on uh, acoustical barriers, sound barriers, would you be kind enough to give us the reference for the rules and regs on that? Um, Mr. Ripps, I think you mentioned there was a law that takes care of that and I assume some rules and regs. Would you be kind enough to, to reference that for us so we can take a look at that? Sure, if you, sure we can send something to Ryan Okay. where it can be downloaded. Thank you. Uh, with respect again to the pedestrian safety issue, um, 
particularly around Honeysuckle, as was mentioned by some of the folks don't know, there's a lot of pedestrian traffic going there and I'm, I'm one of them. Um, is, is it not possible to use some sort of traffic calming techniques to slow traffic down there or uh, use some other techniques that you, you guys have or maybe even a pedestrian bridge over the highway? Is that out of the question? Um, we can we can certainly look at the traffic calming, you know, opportunities. You know, one of the natural. I know I know people are gonna laugh or think I'm making a joke, but one of the things that that causes traffic calming, traffic drives slow when there is more traffic. So less traffic, more pe faster people drive, and so what's really interesting over this whole uh, COVID pandemic situation, traffic dropped off dramatically. And so um, our folks across the state started looking, okay, hey, we're actually gonna get to a point in the state of Texas where there's not gonna be a death on, on a Texas highway. You know, with less traffic, that's gonna happen. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Um, we actually kind of saw a spike in the more, more fatality, more, more of the, the, the crash, more of the crashes that resulted in you know, incapacitating fatalities because the speeds increased generally across the board um, due to the drop in um, traffic volumes. So tra speed is kind of a, a funny thing in, in regards to the, tra you know, the traffic volumes. But we'll, what we can look at is some traffic calming options, um, maybe with some curb or extended curb or something like that. Um, additional warning signs as you're approaching the uh, signal there at Honeysuckle where the school's at, you know, um, that's something, something we can certainly do. We can look at, uh, kind of curious if we can look at something at Honeysuckle for me. I think the sidewalks there are six foot. And this project, by the way, I know pedestrians kind of came up, but this project is building sidewalks to meet all ADA along the corridor where, where it can be accommodated within the right of way. Um, the hard part is, you know, you're, you're in the, a lot of this area is already sidewalk, back of sidewalk to back of sidewalk from property line to property line. And we certainly don't want to go by someone's backyard to build a sidewalk. So due to the constraints, you know, we're trying to do the best we can with that. So know that, you know, the pedestrians are going to be accommodated um, in this project and they're part of the plan. Okay, thanks. Uh, with respect to, it seems that the, the driving force behind this project is improved safety all the fatalities out there and all the crashes that you guys have uh, taught us about. Did I, did I understand the statistics properly when you said that after the project is built, you expected between a 10% and 30% improvement in safety? I know the, the, the improvement in speed was dramatic, but the improvement in safety seemed rather modest. Did I, did I understand? Correctly. Those numbers were about specific improvements. So when we um, increase weave and merge distances, that's kind of the range of those items generally studied across the, the nation. When you do those things, it improves safety by 10 to 30 percent. So that was about a specific location, specific improvement. Across the project, we are expecting improved safety. It's just, it depends. It's so many little things we're changing in a broad area. I don't think we have a number, and Julie, maybe you can correct me, I'm wrong, but it says for the whole project, we have this percentage. I don't think we have that. No, it is specific as well as the total number that we're reducing um, on front of the mainland. I'm sorry, I wasn't able to understand her. That's great. There's not a total percentage, but we're showing reduction in crashes along different locations on both the frontage roads and main lanes. All righty, thank you. Okay. Um, do you have any estimate of what your uh, construction time might be? Is it a five-year deal or? 20 years or what, what's this going to take roughly? We don't have a specific construction schedule right now yet. I think we were anticipating somewhere around two or three years. Clayton, does that sound okay. reasonable? 
Yeah, and it's we're we're in nowhere near detailed plans development. And that's where we develop kind of that construction schedule. Um, we have just high level. We take a stab at okay, how long will this take? How would you build this job sequentially? And so, like given you know the constrained areas here and uh, uh, visiting with a, a, a lot of the folks, especially on the eastern side of the corridor, you know, with their businesses and and uh, things, you know, they were asking us about timeline. You know, we you know, there will be incentives and disincentives for the eventual contractor, you know, to get out there and get get their work done and get out. That's a good point. Something, too, yeah, this this whole project is not. It's kind of deceiving because it looks like it kind of appears like we're just tearing everything out, but it's not going to be like that. It's it's really more spot locations where you're making these changes. It's not going to just be four tenders going to be tore up for this whole stretch. Um, we're not completely rebuilding or redoing the main lanes. The main lanes are really staying. Everything's kind of staying basically where it is. We're adding and changing some elements to it. You know, building some bridges here over there at at um, Blanco and. Uh, military and then working over there towards the interchange um, at McCullough. But really it's not, it's not, it's, it's not as a, as intense of a, of a big construction project. Like if you're, if you're driving down I-10 East, or if you ever had to drive up I-10 West out towards Bernie, you know, it's not going to be like, like that. Um, it's going to be more spot kind of location to the very end. We're going to come in and mill and overlay all the main lanes and, and uh, front of Joe's and make everything look, look good, look good at the end. All right, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, I appreciate y'all taking the time to uh, sit here and listen with us and share hear some of our, some of our concerns. Um, I just wanted to echo what some of my colleagues and one of the residents have said that in this day and age, I think we're trying to focus on walkability for our city for a variety of reasons, improve access, health. Uh, and to some extent, it feels like this is kind of going against that. And at the end of the day, aside from walkability, it's also the Castle Hills charm because this really truly is the middle of our city. And as I said before, when we were dealing with Honeysuckle, a small change for TxDOT is a big change for Castle Hills. Um, Y'all were very receptive to our, our input Previously, and I'm hoping that there's no change in that a lot of what's been discussed tonight is um, not falling on deaf ears, but hopefully constructive criticism so we can work forward together and come up with a plan that's going to work for the city and for TxDOT and for uh, the San Antonio area. I know we'll have a couple more comments up here. Uh, Mr. Gregory. On your letter. You said the purpose of the project was to improve safety, congestion, and mobility. The purpose of improvements are designed to address safety, congestion, and operational concerns. This is gonna have a negative economic effect on a lot of homes in Castle Hills. When you fail to put up sound barriers and you fail to acknowledge the increased traffic on the access roads is going to be a lot of more pollution in the air, you're going to have a tremendous negative impact on a lot of residential homes throughout that corridor that come close to where the, these changes are going to be. Uh, that impacts the city on what the city can do in pr providing goods and services and internal improvements. This is going to be a significant impact. It's not going to be a minor one. Once you have people wanting to leave as opposed to wanting to come in, you can't reverse that. It's virtually a, a non-reversible type thing for years. So I know these were none of the concerns you had, and I understand that. Um, I, I, um, I want to take a personal side to thank Mrs. Scott. Um, I think Moretta did an outstanding observation of what, what the impact of what you all are doing on the city would be. But the economic impact would be a real blow to a negative blow to the city and all the homeowners in this particular area. Um, may not mean much to you, but I would think if we were Alamo Heights as opposed to Castle Hills, uh, those concerns would have been taken into account. 
But nevertheless, uh, you cannot dismiss the economic negative impact. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. Okay, um, if there are no further comments, we'll proceed to item number two, a discussion of possible action on the proposed I-410 at US 281 San Pedro Avenue operational improvements. Uh, truthfully, I had uh, recommended that we put this on the agenda in the event that council felt it appropriate to develop a committee to look into this a little bit further. Um, you know, Councilman Isbran and I had a conversation and uh, it really is a lot for city council to look at it holistically. And at the end of the day, we don't know everything. So it's really good if we can get citizen input and work with the, the gentleman at TxDOT, the, the people at TxDOT, I should say, uh, to make sure that we're addressing things that might have otherwise gone missed. So that being said, uh, this is the agenda item. Mr. Isbrand. Um Mayor and Council, um, first, it's, I, again, I appreciate the folks from TxDOT um, coming out tonight virtually to discuss this with us. And I suspect that they have the kind of job that no one's ever satisfied with what they bring forward. So it's sort of like being a city council member, I guess, in a way. Um, but I had hoped to come into this meeting and to leave a little bit more settled about some of the concerns that I have. And I have to confess, I don't feel any less concerned and perhaps I feel maybe a little bit more concerned about this. Um, it strikes me that, you know, in the interest of what they're uh, talking about improving highway safety, the effort that's being made here um, is not in the interest of improving traffic safety in Castle Hills or the safety and well being of our community. And that's our first and foremost obligation, not what happens in front of North Star Mall or San Pedro or 281 or whatever the case may be. And what I've heard tonight are lingering issues for me related to health and safety and well being. Among them, I, I heard it said tonight that there is no noise analysis right now. There, I believe the statement was they're working on that. There is no pedestrian assessment and there was no commitment that I heard that there would be any pedestrian assessment. Um, there was the, uh, there was, uh, I felt a lack of useful data to help us understand what the true impact would be on our access roads and in lieu of them being able to bring forward a number, I just sat here and thought for a minute and thought, maybe we should get some lawn chairs and go sit on the side of the access road um, over in the estate section and see what the noise sounds like with traffic right now, much less with the projected 16,000 cars per day that they're talking about pushing that way in the future. I understand that these are complicated issues that they have uh, to, to address the traffic, but I don't think that doing them at the expense of Castle Hills is the appropriate thing to do here. And probably the things that concern me the most uh, are the truly unanswered questions about any consideration of the pedestrian or foot traffic related to, in particular, children coming from Castle Hills Elementary and of closing off one of the main arteries to our city from Northwest Military Drive to Blanca Road to get here. And I think there are a great number of unanswered questions that truly warrant further work on their part. And I think it would be appropriate for this council as a body to communicate that to them through some resolution so that they understand the full impact of how the, the how Castle Hills will receive these, you know, tens of thousands of cars, this, these additional issues that they have brought up. So I hope that in the course of this evening, we can discuss um, whether we think it's appropriate to bring forward some resolution as a body rather than just as individuals to uh, convey this information to Texton. Mr. May. I support that. And in fact, the conclusion I made after hearing what I heard tonight was the scheme is to make the access roads in Castle Hills an extension of the freeway, simply put. What I also heard were 
answers did not that did not adequately consider the schools, businesses, churches, public services, both police and fire, pedestrians, and most importantly, residents. So I would sponsor a resolution that would direct TxDOT to reevaluate the scheme from Blanco to West Avenue, considering those elements that I just listed. Thank you, Mr. May. Mr. Joyce, you look pensive. Well, I support both of those. I wonder, should we put a little committee together, as you suggested, Mayor, for the next week or so and study these things and come up with a resolution and vote on it next time? Mr. Isbrand? Well, Ms. Joyce, this is one of the problems that we have. We don't have till next week. The um, commitment or the deadline, I'm sorry for this, is in is two days from now. So I think in an ideal world, um, if, and if there had been more advance notice of the virtual public hearing and their availability to do this, that would be an excellent thing to do. I just think we're really up against the wall here time-wise now. Mr. Rampley, do you know if we have any latitude as far as submitting uh, maybe official statements from the city? I know the public virtual uh, town hall was till the 29th, but I'm hopeful, hopeful that we have a little more latitude. Uh, I, I'll, I'll speak to um, someone from text out there and see if that is the case. But if that, our, our notice or public information from this body of council can be extended uh, from that standpoint. Well, I, I think we need something a little more. Mr. Pressing. Mayor? Yes, sir, Mr. Paul. My concern in listening to all this tonight from text <coughs> is how serious they will take our concerns back and do something. And I think Mr. May's resolution would solve that because it would be more identifying specifically as opposed to hope that they just hurt us good and take our conversation back. So if, I'm, I'm all for uh, having a resolution like Mr. May commented. And Mr. Paul, I completely agree with you. Um, that being said, I'm optimistic that TxDOT wants to hear from us and they're gonna be receptive. We saw that with Honeysuckle. Uh, we saw that with the other plans they had. I feel like they listened. And I'd hate to make a blanket resolution in haste as opposed to identifying issues specifically and having a more collaborative approach. And I'm, I'm hoping Mr. Rips came on to give us some I was just gonna say he's back on, let's ask him. <laughs> in that regard. About the time frame, Mr. Rips. Yes, yeah, so yeah, the official comment period, what, what we can do is um, extend that, you know, if you can give us a, a time or, you know, when we could expect something that way we know we won't um, wrap up and uh, finish our, our uh, the environmental summary of that. Because what what's happening right now with this whole project is we're actively doing the environmental. So a lot of the things, you know, that were brought up and discussed from the air, the noise, community impacts, all of that is studied just like it is with every single project that we do. Um, it's in accordance with NEPA which is the federal guidance and then with the state laws and all applicable rules um, regarding the project. So I apologize for, we didn't exactly cover that, but that's all inclusive of the projects that we, that we do. Um, so no, that's an ongoing, that's ongoing. You know, it's not finished. It's not wrapped up. It's a continued process, you know, as we're taking a project from, you know, what we started looking at several years ago and carrying it through um, to fruition. Uh, Mr. Rips, when, I guess in this sure. case, Clayton, our next council meeting is November 10th. Would that be suffice for us to have this as an agenda item for them to put this resolution and turn in to you the next day on November 11th? Is that, would that be that, in this case? That's fine. Ryan, if you can email, email myself and Richard De La Cruz, you know that and that way we have it and we our folks know that hey this will be coming forthcoming and we can we can certainly accommodate 
Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Ribs. Mr. Risbrand. I, I, I appreciate what we're attempting to do here, and I appreciate Mr. Ribs' comments and good intentions, but that doesn't guarantee that anybody above him or anywhere else is going to agree to that. Um, I do believe we have the opportunity tonight, based on the uh, language that Mr. May has already put forward, that we could go on the record tonight expressing our concern about these areas. Perhaps then if uh, Mr. Rips wants to convey to TxDOT that we would bring a expanded or further developed resolution after our next regularly scheduled meeting, that would be um, that would be wonderful that we could get into it, but I don't feel comfortable given that we have 48 hours to get this thing done that without something, uh, and again, Mr. Ripps, this is in no regard to you, but unless it's in writing, I don't think we should assume that the state of Texas is going to say, yeah, we'll, we'll give it to you. We could pass a general resolution tonight that would outline what our concerns are and bring them greater data, or they could come to us for that um, next month. I'm not sure how council feels, but I think that might be the best of both worlds. Mr. Rapley? No, Mayor, I don't have an issue with that. If you'd like to do it, then um, we'll bring the actual document back uh, on the November 10th meeting. But as Councilman Isbrand said, let's get him on the record tonight. Okay, well, we don't have the luxury of having uh, Mr. Schnall with us, so we'll have to be resourceful in our crafting of this resolution. And I'll leave it to one of my colleagues to start that. Mr. May. I'm working on it right now. So I may make some errors here, but as any council knows, you preserve your rights. And I appreciate what you said, because I don't want to hear it later that, oh, you had your opportunity and we didn't put it down in writing. So I'm, I'm going to try to cobble together the things that I said before. And if I get it wrong, please correct it. I'm open to amendments. All right. Mr. May, would you lower your mask just briefly enough so we can? Sure. I move that the city council of Castle Hills express its desire to the text dot planning committee on the 410-281 project to refocus its attention on that portion, which is from Blanco to West Avenue with greater attention to considerations such as schools, businesses, churches, public services to include police and fire departments, pedestrians, residents, and public safety. Should we add noise or is that included? And noise. <laughs> How, somehow have an economic impact of what they want to do in there. Is that an amendment? Well, it, well it, yes. And an economic impact. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that was pretty good for a, a quick run at it. Mr. Isbrand. Uh, Mr. May, would you include as part of that and in that TxDOT will, be, will receive a detailed summary of Castle Hills' concerns following its November 10th regular city council election. I, I would accept that amendment in a separate sentence, moreover, and then insert your language. Okay, I didn't know if you were actually making a motion or just- I think he's still- Writing it in air here. Where, so. It's in the air. Right. I, I guess my point being that if we adopt this, that we would all tell them we will be coming back with the desire to be heard more specifically following November 10th or November election or November council. Yes. Okay, so we have a uh, good motion on the table. Do we have a second? A second. second by Mr. Joyce. Uh, oh Lord. <laughs> All right. Okay. Is there anyone back there that heard this and actually remembers it? it well, we have it recorded, so um, 
you can piece it a bit together as best as you can, and we can also rely on the recordings when we draft the resolution. Okay, I'm, I'm going to do my best here. I move that the City Council of Castle Hills express its desire to text dot development committee on the 281 410 project to provide further consideration from that portion of the project from Blanco Avenue to West Avenue, taking into greater consideration schools, businesses, churches, public services to include police and fire department, pedestrians, residents, public safety, economic impact and noise. Moreover, Moreover that the city of Castle Hills City Council will instruct with greater particularity after the November 10th City Council meeting other concerns with this project. Okay, Mr. Isbrand. Would you just be willing to strike the word other there because I think it would be an articulation of these concerns? That's fine. Thank I'm you, sir. Okay. That being said, uh, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you, Council. Mr. Rapley? Mayor, I'll just let you know that Ms. Craig will be here tomorrow. She'll uh, draft this together and put it um, in writing as we indicated tonight, and I'll send that over to TxDOT uh, when she finishes that, and then obviously have a full resolution on the November 10th meeting. Okay, and lastly, do we need any kind of resolution to create a committee to address this issue? Um, I wouldn't need, to, I would not think you would need a, a resolution. I think the council can act to identify two council members to um, develop or work up the details on this. Okay. Um, we can just do that independently outside of council. Is that correct? That shouldn't be an issue. Do me a favor. If you want to check with Mr. Schnell on that tomorrow morning. Okay. And if we have to codify it, uh, we could do that via emergency session. That being said, uh, do we have any announcements by any council members? All right, it is 9.07, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Mr. May? Mr. Mayor, I move that we adjourn. A second by Mr. Paul, all in favor? 9.07, everybody have a good evening. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for everybody at TechStop for your help and for being here with us.